Hey, banditos. Welcome to a special Friday episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits. I'm Mike Farah. And boy, do we have a great interview for you today. It is Dean Haspiel. Dean is an independent comics creator. He's out of Brooklyn, New York. A lot of his comics have to do with Brooklyn. He is an amazing conversationalist. And we get into everything soup to nuts in his career. So we talk about coming up through Upstart Associates, working uh, and assisting Howard Chaikin on American Flag, Walter Simonson on Thor, Bill Sienkiewicz on New Mutants and Electro Assassin. How's that for a cauldron of fire in terms of getting into the comic industry? And then, of course, he just kind of knocks it out of the park day after day on his independent stuff, starting with Keyhole. Uh, and his uh, long-running character, Billy Dogma. Um, he worked with Harvey Picar on American Splendor, as well as a graphic novel called The Quitter. He's been into web comics, so definitely check those out. And he has a cluster of recent work that you want to check out. So those are things like The Red Hook, Billy Dogma, as well as COVID Cop. So without further ado, this is Dean Hester. His name is Dean Haspiel. Dean, how you doing? I'm doing great, Michael. Th thanks for having me on. This yeah, absolutely. Welcome to the show. So we're going to start you off with uh, the question you may have answered a million times before, but we always are almost contractually obligated at this point to ask because it's our first question uh, du jour. And that is, how did you first discover comic books? Uh, I discovered comic books. Well, I don't know if one was ever first handed to me by an adult or a parent, uh, but I, I have a clearer memory of going to the newsstand when we had newsstands or when there were more newsstands than there are now. And, you know, they had everything at the newsstand plus candy. Uh, and I noticed on the side wall was a whole bunch of comic books. So I, I'm guessing I was probably handed some comics, but not on a regular basis. What made it regular was the fact that the comic rack at the newsstand changed every week. Like most people would, or fans would buy the latest issue of Green Lantern or whatever it was, right? And then next week would be Marvel 2 and 1 and the next set of comics, right? So I started to uh, pick up comics and then decided, oh, I'm going to be following this character or this series on a regular basis, right? Um, I think the first few comics I fell in love with were uh, Shazam, which was DC's way of doing a Captain Marvel comic without calling it Captain Marvel, at least not on the title of the book, because I guess at that point, Marvel uh, got the copyright on Captain Marvel, even though Captain Marvel came first through the character Shazam or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. and it was drawn by CC Beck and written by Denny O'Neill at the time. And years later, I would befriend uh, Denny's son, Larry, who I was just in a hot tub with at a, uh, Brooklyn Banya yesterday with because uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. Um, the other comics I remember falling in love with and following religiously were uh, uh, The Fantastic Four uh, and probably Spider-Man. I don't remember picking up a lot of Batman comics because I was watching the Batman TV show and I thought it was corny. I mean, I watched it all the time, but the kid, as a kid, I was like, this is corny. Like, what's this about? As an adult, Oh my God, that's one of the best TV shows ever made. It's insane. You know, like uh, the costume design, uh, the colors, uh, the way they they adapted it. It was almost like taking, you know, you know, you ever look at old Batman comics and like he looks like a zebra or yeah. rainbow Batman or, you know, or Dick Sprang or whatever style, yeah. you know? Uh, I love that kind of Batman. I also like a Frank Miller Dark Knight as well, you know, of course. Uh, but as a kid, I wasn't as much into reading Batman comic books, okay? Uh, so, and then Marvel 2 and 1, because uh, the thing became my favorite character. So, and and then I, as as much as I could devour, Captain America, Iron Man, Hulk, all, all a lot of the Marvel stuff. I was really more into Marvel than DC as a kid. And then I would soon discover this thing called the comic shop, or you know, certain places that had like alternative zines or like underground comics. There was a place called Soho Zat in Soho, New York, uh, where um, I discovered Harvey Picar's American Splendor and Chester Brown's Yummy Fur. And I was like, wait a second. 
you know, my dream of possibly becoming a penciler of the Fantastic Four one day, which happened. Uh, I did draw Canon FF. Uh, my my dream kind of expanded, and I realized, wait, not only could I write and draw stories about my life, thanks to comics like American Splendor, uh, but then with Chester Brown's Yummy Fur, I could create and invent my own universes and and weird, you know, fiction, you know. So it kind of gave me this permission to think outside my initial kind of love for the medium, you know, where all I saw originally was the assembly line. Right. Uh, and now I am the assembly line, you know, uh, as much as I do love to collaborate, because I think collaborating is important as an artist and a creator, because it, it forces you to do things you wouldn't necessarily do. And, and there's a lot of unique challenges that come with collaborating. And I've collaborated with, with some of the best, you know, Mark Wade, James DeMatteis, my buddy, uh, Jonathan Ames, writer Jonathan Ames, Harvey P. Carr, uh, so many uh, different things I've done. Uh, yeah, so it started at probably at the newsstand is where I fell in love with comics. A lot to unpack in that answer, and we're going to get to do a bunch of it. Um, but as for the comics themselves, we always like to ask the follow-up question, which is, do you have any of those like first comics uh, that you got, or are they sort of gone to the... To the wind i have them all i have i don't i don't have a home i have a warehouse that i sleep in basically you know my apartment like most new york apartments are you know pretty tight small um uh you're not really i don't think you're really meant to stay in an apartment too long because of what's happening outside so you're encouraged to kind of like sleep eat shower and if you have a nice enough living room, maybe entertain a few guests to watch a movie or play some cards or something. Right. Uh, I used to be able to do that. I can't anymore. You know, I have a girlfriend that lives with me that has two items in my apartment because that's how many comics and DVDs. And I don't I didn't do the toy thing. I know a lot of people have action figures and all that. I, I never went down that road. I did play with toys as a kid and I might have some of those. But to, to but the answer to your question is I, I have them all. In fact, I have about 95% of every comic I've ever drawn. Wow. Which is another thing that's kind of, I'm not yeah. like the kind of artist that the minute I draw something, I try to sell it, you right. know? Uh, and that would be, that would be good because I could use the income. Trust me, <laughs> you know? Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, ha I have it all. And, and I haven't looked at a lot of it since. And as I get older, I do wonder, like, well, what am I doing with all this stuff? You know, it's not garbage. Yeah, it's precious and, and uh, emotional on, on one extent, but also, you know, uh, maybe I should sell it, or maybe there's also a part of me that wants to kind of donate it to like some kind of amazing kind of you know library of cool comics and other ephemera. You know, mm. so but. Yeah, it's also mostly online. I'm sure you can see a lot of this stuff digitally if you wanted to. Right. But nothing beats right. holding that comic book, which exactly. I exactly right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's why we always ask it because there, are, you know, there are folks that um, collected from like an early age, and right. you know, and there are some that you know have just like read them and beat to death, and they still have them. And there's some that you know have mom threw them out. You know, uh, mom and dad sold them. You know, and so everybody has a different story. At one point, I forget who it was. They said they put it in an attic and or or a basement and rats got to it and ate all of their like original yeah. comics. In fact, I just started, I got two storage units in my building because they finally added some storage units. And as I was about to bring down a whole bunch of cardboard boxes, uh, uh, my landlord said, no, you got to you can't do that. You have to buy plastic containers because, yeah. you know, rats floods, whatever. Right. And I was like, but I can't afford that. <laughs> you know? So I did get a bunch of plastic containers for other stuff. And I've yet to, what I've decided is this, I'm going to go through all my stuff and I'm going to let go of some things. It's again, it's not garbage. It's not going on, on the stoop, right. To be given away. I, I'm going to have to figure out a relationship with somebody that's either willing to do some kind of Etsy situation or something or or some something else I don't know yet maybe some kind of donation but then they'll they'll be the books and the comics that I know I will revisit and and one of the caveats I've given myself is uh, I, I think I return to the first twenty five years of Marvel more than I do 
the latter 25 years, right? And I think it ends with uh, that 25th anniversary basically ends around Secret Wars. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, All right. So that'll be around That's 61 to 80. 80? 85 is it 80, it's, it's early 80s isn't it yeah it's early <laughs> 80s. yeah so that's kind of like now and of course there are other arcs that i love like mark wade and where ringo's ff you know arc or like there are certain arcs i would take but if there's a bunch of random stuff that maybe i know i won't revisit it's okay to let go you know and the fact of the matter is if i really desperately needed to get this the certain comics again you can find them you right. know um but in terms of just being like you know, the custodian of this stuff, I, there's no space. Yeah. It's insane, yeah. You know? No, and I've totally definitely understand. cut down on my reading. I mean, I, I'd probably pick up Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and maybe three or four other books. And I've started to do a no more interesting thing now that I've entered the, the Kickstarter uh, ecosystem of comics is um, I've been going online, uh, like on Etsy or other kind of places where, you know, when I was younger... You could go to, like I said, this place called Soho Zat or a place called See Here uh, or a couple other places in New York. And you could uh, pick up cool zines or alternative comics. Right. And that's kind of transition now more, I think, online. Right. Uh, but, you you know, but, or with crowdfunding, you can get weird, cool alternative comics. You know, yeah. I love those just as much, if not more than mainstream comics, to be honest. You know, the older you get, uh, the more you can see the, unfortunately, some of the corporate editorial attitude, uh, you know, that that dictates a, a lot of, of, you know, the, the big two comics, as it were. Right. And sometimes people sneak in and will do some really good, interesting stuff. But mm -hmm. in general, it's more editorially driven, you know, and now that there are more eyes on these icons and these characters because of TV and movies. You know, they're probably paying more attention to, well, what are the comics going to be like? And, you know, that can that there's a tug of war there, I think, you know, whereas like the outliers don't give a shit. They're like, I'm just going to go crazy and go right. nuts, and you know, do weird stuff. And as I get older, that's more what what compels me or interests me, you know, to to, you know, stay in comics. Yeah. I, I think I feel that, too. You know, I, I think maybe everybody's getting older. They're looking for more of the um well more diverse diet of content first of all but also something more experimental right there are so yeah. many there's so much uh so much money involved in the uh big two and corporate comics that they can't help but be like super conservative in what they can do and people right. are you know constrained to right you know and i get not, it and not do they, what they want to do but they've done a pretty interesting job uh at least Marvel, I think, has done a really good job of still trying to create stories with heart and meaning, yeah. you know, even though, Green. you know, you don't really need to. Like, I just watched um, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Yeah. The, the oh second one? Yeah, that, that's the sequel, right? That's the sequel. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. It's phenomenal. It, it's phenomenal. Like, I'm watching storytelling techniques that, like, it, like combines comics and cinema in a new hybrid and new and animation in a way that I've never seen. Yeah. Plus the artwork is amazing. Um, the characters are human, you know, and, and they understand that now that we've been watching, uh, you know, now that Hollywood took over comics in some yeah. way, there's all these shorthands and shortcuts that you don't need to like, you know, revisit an origin anymore. You just have to kind of infer and everyone knows it now, right. you know, because Marvel and DC is our American mythology. You know, just like the Norse have theirs and the Greek, you know, have their gods. We we have ours now that everyone basically knows their, their story. So right. now put them in a situation, you know? Um, so yeah, I was blown away, but also exhausted by it at the same time. It's just incredible to, it's psychedelic, man. Yeah. Yeah. The, the action is so kinetic and yeah. uh, it does kind of wear, wear you down in a certain way. You wear down your like eyeballs and brain. <laughs> well, and the thing that's that, that they understood though, is like, yeah, sure. People love that as do I, or we do, but really the moments that you remember is when it quiets down, they take a pause 
and and there's something meaningful about to happen, you know, with right. eyes or a gesture. And it's not, you know, the next clever way to punch someone, you right. know? Yeah. I'm with you. All right. Let me let me let me back up a little bit here. So um so you had an early exposure to comics themselves, right? Um, but you also had an early exposure to the industry, which I want to talk about a little bit, but also in the context of you, wh- when did you start to think, um, or when did you realize that this could be a potential, like, career, basically, for you? And and then how did that maybe mix in with your, and how did you make your way to Upstart Associates, which I read was sort of that early industry exposure for you? Sure. That to me was like, in some ways, like comic school, because we didn't have comic school. I mean, we we technically did. We had the School of Visual Arts, which is a college that they teach comics at. And a lot, actually, a lot of my friends teach their uh, comics at SVA. And in fact, I uh, uh, was a guest uh, lecturer about a month or so ago in Josh Neufeld's class. Josh Neufeld is a, a dude I grew up with in, from high school, you know, making comics. Um, I mean, listen, Howard Chaykin calls it a calling. I call it also a curse, you know, because once you find your calling, you can't do anything else. Okay. So for me, for a long time, it was comics only. And at the time, comics were not cool. I don't know if they're cool still, but they definitely weren't cool when I was young. Okay. Um, And and so I kind of had to defend my passion in school. And you find your tribe through other people you know, reading comics secretly in their in their notebooks or, you know, uh, social, you know, studies books or something like that, right? And then you kind of make eyes with each other and then you start to hang out and you debate, you know, the characters and the stories and you realize you're having dialogue and, and discussion and, and you know, you, you're making friends and then you're deciding, well, let's make comics. I'll do my version of that character and you'll do your version of your favorite character or whatever, you know? And so you're making comics in high school. Uh, which is what we did and then you and then for me i was like well i need to turn this into a job like this is the only thing i want to do right so again i think i mentioned larry o'neill earlier his uh dad denny o'neill had heard that um upstar studios needed uh, a, a an assistant that is howard chaykin who was working on american flag at the time needed an assistant so larry got the gig and uh, at the time, Upstart also had Walt Simonson working on Thor and another artist named Jim Sherman, who, if you look him up, is a great cartoonist. He hasn't done too much. I think he did like Legion of Superhero Stories and stuff like that. Uh, he was great. James Sherman. Uh, and also did, I think, some comics for Epic and some other stuff. And I probably, probably made more money in advertising or something. And previous um, artists of the studio was like Frank Miller um god who's the guy who did howard the duck who drew howard the duck he was steve part gerber, of that right no no that's the writer steve gerber is the oh, writer. um um and i've met him oh, he's geez. a cool guy but him i think jim starlin was there for a minute maybe but down the hall uh it was dennis cowan michael davis and bill sinkevich and bill sinkevich got wind that howard had an assistant so he was like i want an assistant and then I became Bill Sienkiewicz's assistant on New Mutants and Electra Assassin. We're talking 1985 right now, which was my senior year of high school. And every day at three o'clock, me and Larry would hop on to our sub on, on the subway, go down to the garment district around 29th Street and 8th Avenue, and go and work on comics with these guys. So uh, eventually, Bill wasn't coming in as much. I got friendly with Dennis Cowan, Michael Davis, who went on. Uh, to become a publisher or a co-publisher and creator with Dennis of Milestone Comics, right? Um, but then uh, Bill wasn't coming as much. I think he was traveling from Connecticut at the time. So I was left with not too much to do. And then Howard probably felt bad for me and needed another assistant. So then I got into Upstart and I was working with Larry and Howard on American Flag. Walt Simonson once in a while would use me to, to help on Thor, some background stuff. Uh, and so there were like three amazing cartoonists that I was very diverse and different cartoonists that I was learning stuff from, right? That when every day when I went to art school, I was learning none of this stuff, you know, it was, it was other stuff. And in fact, a lot of the art, art teachers frowned upon the fact that I wanted to do comics, you know, 
Uh, although once in a while, when you mention you want to do comics, some people are like, I always want to do comics. They would like, you know, duck their head and kind of like whisper in my ear how much they wanted to be a cartoonist, but never uh, could do it because they were either too afraid or maybe it doesn't make a lot of money, which it doesn't. I mean, there was an era and there were certain artists obviously out there that have done very well. Not me, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think that that was the beginning of, of, of the stranglehold on my life. Uh, but what I did discover while making comics for so many years is actually what I love is visual storytelling, you know? So going back to movies and TV, like I went to SUNY Purchase College and I went in for art, but I uh, at some point transitioned into film. So I'm making little movies. In fact, I made a couple of short films recently. Uh, I've written some plays. I like I like the storytelling mediums, you know, and I try to figure out um, how to craft story to uh, towards the virtues of each medium, you know. Uh, but I still feel like every time I do a comic, it's it's I'm always trying to do something a little bit new, a little bit better, you know, than the last one I did. Uh, it, it's a constant learning lesson by doing, and and you grow up in public when you put this stuff out there, you're up for scrutiny, you know. So you kind of got to get a thick skin and, and you know, and listen to the, the the positive criticism and some of the negative. You know, there isn't so much I can do with, when somebody praises me. I can go, thank you very much. But it's when someone kind of disses me or goes, wait a second, that sucked. And I'll be like, but why? And maybe I can learn from that, you know. But it's still out there because I get comics that come to me at, at any Comic-Con. And, I, and I, I, I often cringe. I was like, oof. I, but you know what? It means I got better. <laughs> that's that's a normal reaction. Yeah, we've had so many uh, folks say that they're they're sort of like look back. But I mean, you you got first of all, you got to start somewhere. You got to right? start and somewhere. And then yeah, and then you progress. Yeah. Um, but it's also you know someone else told me that you know no matter where it is in your career, even if it's at the very beginning where you think it's like not your best, um, it's always probably somebody's favorite. Right. There'd be it, people yeah. that's like that. That was my favorite book. And you can't you know, you can't fault them for that, even if you see yeah. all the uh, the wrinkles also, there, and creases. Well, also, there's something raw, right, about your first stuff where, right. you know, yeah, you're trying, but you only have a certain uh, skill set and ability. And, you know, I mean, again, going back to some of these zines that I that I try to find on on online, like they're definitely raw, man. They're like. You know, but that's what I love about it. it there, there's this innate kind of naivety to to the comics work that reminds me of when I was a kid. So it kind of brings me back. And maybe that's what I'm I'm looking for is that sensibility, you know, because the, the more you, you, you do it, the better you get at your craft, the slicker you are, blah, blah, blah. That's not as interesting, you know, as those initial marks that what you make, you know, uh, whether they fail or or, or, or they succeed doesn't matter at that point. It's just that initial taking that blank piece of paper, right, and and doing something with it. I think is is key and important. Yeah, it's um, it's about growth, right? And it's almost sometimes better to see the growth on paper than it is to see sort of the arrival, right? The the uh, the trip versus the destination. <laughs> right, 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 right. The journey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sure, exactly. Just watching the journey. You know? Right. So let's yeah. talk about one of your um, early projects. I think it was just either you were in college or just out of college where um, you introduced um, your character who has recurred now and has been in a recent Kickstarter, Billy Dogma, as yeah. part of uh, Keyhole, which I think was an anthology uh, so, comic so, that you put together. So, so Keyhole Comics was a two man anthology with Josh Newfeld. Mm -hmm. And he did half the book and I did the other half, although we, we intermingled our stories. And um, I think it, I think we've done seven issues total. Uh, there were four, four issues at um, Millennium Comics, which no longer exists. But then we started an imprint called Modern Comics, I think with Keyhole or at least Keyhole issue number two or something. I can't remember. And then after four issues of that, uh, Top Shelf scooped us up, Chris Staros and Brett Warnock. And we did issues five and six uh, with uh, them, and 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 kind of upgraded, uh, uh, you know, the 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 design 
and and you know we would go to SPX and do all these other kind of indie shows, which were a lot of fun. Uh, and then about I don't know, way too many years later, Josh and I did our our twenty fifth anniversary issue, which was issue number seven. Um, but I I I did I debut Billy Dogma. I think I debuted Billy Dogma actually in a, in a local newspaper in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Oh, okay. But in comics form, it was in Keyhole. And then he got his own little series uh, at that Modern Comics Millennium Publishing for about three or four issues. Uh, and then I did a couple more issues, uh, uh, one shots at Top Shelf. And, he, and I've hopscotched throughout the years revisiting uh, Billy Dogma and Jane Legit. Uh, these two love titans are attracted to conflict, you know, and that conflict is their romance, you know, um, and how their love affects uh, their community and not only themselves, but the people around them, you know, uh, and I believe I created Billy Dom in 1995. And so, yeah, I've had graphic novels. I I, I did a web series with with uh, these characters. Uh collections i mean it's run the gamut every like five to ten years i kind of revisit these characters right and then recently uh they were the subject of my second kickstarter um where i did a 48 page like primer collection let's call it called billy dama and jane legit that which i i believe i sent to you and and you you read yeah uh i'd like to get some of your thoughts but uh basically they're just vignettes of their love story, uh, including new material uh, toward the end, which is a silent comic. I'm, I'm usually pretty verbose, as you can tell by this, <laughs> this parlay right now. But even in my writing, I have a kind of verbosity or kind of like a beatnik type slang or whatever that I do, you know, uh, because I like to have fun with words and, and pictures. And uh, yeah, I put this together and it was uh, my second successful Kickstarter. And uh, yeah. you got a chance to to check it out. Yeah, I I, I mean, I loved it. I thought it was uh, really. Uh, first of all, I like the the style or the format of doing these vignettes, right? So, not everything has to be sort of a uh, you know magnum opus narrative complexity um, you know monster, right? So, I like having these little stories and um, that are more about the wordplay, the emotion, and the kind of just the heightened environment of the characters, right? So I thought that was very cool. Um, but I also, you know, I, I guess I wasn't prepared for uh, this, you know, when I saw it and I read a little bit about it, I was like, okay, so it's going to be about these two characters, but to have this in, in an emotional way, it's sort of like an just an over-the-top, like, love story, you know, yeah. almost, almost yeah. like... Um, you know, catastrophically, yeah, apocalyptic. <laughs> apocalyptically um, in love uh, characters, um, which I thought was very cool. And also what was interesting is that you were sort of applying that to um, characters that also spoke and thought in a very kind of retro way. So it was at once retro, but also at the same time, kind of like over the top. Right. And I thought that was an interesting kind of combo for for that approach. Well, I'm a 56 year old man from New York City, right? So, like, it, it, some people who would read it now would be like, "Oh, Dean, there's so much of the male gaze in here." I'm like, "Well, there's a lot of female gaze too, you know." Like, and I'm not I'm not going to apologize for that because I think that is part of attraction, you know, and mm -hmm. and how sometimes people look at each other in certain ways. Uh, but then they're going to go the extra mile for other reasons, you know, and there's that there's that dance, you know, between between romantic partners like uh, and and actually what's weird about this series for me is that I, I've had, you know, several different girlfriends while drawing and writing these comics. So they kind of all amalgamate. And then I realized, wait, no, I'm Jane Legit. You know, and I think Billy Dogma is what I wish I was, but he's kind of can be a bumbling, you know, fool at times. Yeah. Uh, but he's the one that's he's willing to go the extra mile, too. You know, like so I don't know, man, I, I feel like like as much as I thought I was assigning uh, characteristics to the to these characters, 
they they largely come from me. So it's kind of like this uh, emotionally biographical story, you know, um, in some ways. But that we're 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 so, some of that stuff never happened, you know. Yeah. But emotionally, they happen. Right. Right. That makes sense, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure the the world or the city didn't depend on you and your girlfriend uh, being together. Right. <laughs> but it felt that it felt that other, way, but, maybe. But it felt like that sometimes, and that's like that's narcissism, you know. Like, right, right. and I try to be honest through through these stories, where yeah, it's complicated. People are complicated, you know, and 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 I. But it's all it's also done. I hope with 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 a, with a little bit of a wink and a cheeky smile too, you know, like. I kind of know what I'm doing, you know, it's kind of like my version of comedy in some way, like, but a sex, you know, like a rom-com or something, but with yeah. fist of fury and like people punching heart-shaped holes into walls and, you right. know, and, and being overt, but the takeaway I think is it, it's meaningful, you know, and, and, and I hope that that's what you, you got out of it. You know? Yeah, sure. It, that, that definitely comes through. And I think it's a unique perspective. Um, you know, what was interesting and to sort of pivot to your other Kickstarter project, which was COVID Cop, is that they both have an element of romance and relationship to them, right? So, um, uh, and I thought that was very interesting. Is that, do you, I mean, is that just like part of who you are and the perspective you bring to to your work? Is that always like the relationship and, and romance is just going to be part of, you know, your your outlook? Right. Well, if, if Billy Dogman, Jane Legit was like an erotic comics noir, right? Uh, COVID Cop was me taking the piss out of the pandemic, right? Of course. Um, but absolutely, I don't think a story matters unless there's some sense of a love story in there for me, for what I need to uh, enjoy or respond to or create, right? And uh yeah, I, 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 when I was trying to sell COVID cop, like, you know, I was at New York Comic Con recently and I had an open studios and you put that cover out there and there's nothing about that cover or that title that says romance comic at all. Right. I mean, I've taken two words that people have an issue with, you know, COVID and cop, put them together. Right. Although I couldn't call it anything else. I tried to call it other things and it just didn't feel right. You know, so and I knew I was going to tell a certain kind of story. And it, it's it's kind of a parody. It's a satire, you know, yeah. about a really heavy, you know, subject. So, but I kind of, the, the, within page one, you already know where you're, you're going to a different direction than you thought picking up the comic. But then lo and behold, halfway through the comic, you realize, wait, is this a love story? There is a love story hidden yeah. inside this comic, you know? And by page 24, I'm hoping people are like, I want to see more. You know, so I've actually written fully the script for the second issue and I have a plot for the third issue uh, and they're all can be standalone. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, because one of the things I'm learning about the ecosystem of Kickstarter and crowdfunding uh, or even self-publishing is that, you know, the minute you're doing issue, you know, a five issue miniseries or something by issue two, half the orders are you, know, you have half the orders from the first issue. And you barely get to three and four. So you might as well have made a graphic novel or something, right? Right. So right. Well, the way I'm thinking is that these are one shots that are interconnected and there's a chron chronology to them, but they also tell a whole story, you know, yeah. but they, they leave you wanting more, I hope, you know? So, um, and they're just these gross, ugly looking people that are in love and, and hopefully you can see past that, you know? Um, and so that that was the fun of trying to figure that out. And trust me, that because that was my first Kickstarter, I had no idea that it would succeed. I thought it's called COVID Cop. I tried to go to a bunch of publishers. Uh, the publishers that uh, were kind enough to read my my script and pitch said it was, they loved it and thought it was really good, but there's no way in hell they would ever publish this because it was called COVID Cop and what it was about. And because we're still living through a time that's really difficult through because of the virus and the pandemic, right? But I also think that that's one of the best things that comics does is confronts these matters head on. And, you know, you can do a serious version of it. You can do a funny version of it. And I've done both, you know. Right. Um, so, you know, between kind of a weird romance comic with hyperbolic love titans, you know, and then like this other kind of story where the backdrop is one of the worst things that happens on, on Earth, you know. And in fact, that's one of my messages is that 
uh, well, one of the worst things that might have happened to Earth is humanity, you know? And that's part of what COVID cop is trying to wrestle with. Is like he's found a sense of hope through a cure, which is also absurd. But it doesn't matter because this is what you know fiction is about. It's what metaphor is about. You know, yeah. is finding that way for hope. You know, and making those human connections. And I think that's what what the the theme of a lot of my comics are ultimately. You know, I liked um, in the video that where you were introducing COVID cop, the comparison to toxic Avenger. Yeah. And I think that speaks a lot to not only the approach, but kind of what you're going for, because toxic Avenger came out, I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong in the eighties, right. Yeah. When, you know, one of the biggest environmental things was like toxic waste and nuclear, you know, right. whatever waste. Um, and so sort of taking that imprint and and moving it to our current era what does that become like what what is the most disgusting you know it's disease and particularly covid so yep. um i thought that was a a great way of sort of like thinking about what this actually is that it's right. not you know you know i mean it has all these ideas going for it but ultimately it's kind of this this parody of something that was very serious and, you know, deadly serious, right. but, right. but has some sort of like social resonance, right? Absolutely. Or like, you know, RoboCop, Judge Dredd, you know, yeah. uh, they, they do that all, all the time, th those kinds of characters. And again, I, I listen, people saw that cover and that title and, and gave me the evil eye, but like, because they were dealing with, you know, uh, pain from this this event that we all suffered and my landlord died from covid you know like i know people who died from it so it wasn't me being disrespectful mm -hmm. it was just me trying to confront it with my own terms with my own abilities and and trying to again find a way through this where we could find some sense of levity if possible but while also imparting some kind of hopeful message you know and i hope people will pick it up or more people will pick it up I haven't made it available to retail yet. I mean, retailers. Right. Uh, I did open an Etsy shop that I'm going to be more robust about and tell people about it. I've been trying to sell it hand over fist at, at uh, comic conventions and other events I'm doing right now. So it's, if, if it's not one thing, it's another, you know? And, and at one point I kept thinking, am I going to be able to like do more with this COVID cop? It's going to go away, right? No, COVID ain't going away. It's going to be a topic for many, many years, you know? Well, and the, title is sort of evocative even if it did go away everybody has it in their immediate memory right, so right. you know you know what it is and you know that it's it's going to be I, something I, about uh, that I, I had a character i did called the red hook which we'll, we'll talk about uh for a minute soon but uh i did the red hook i did four and a half seasons of the red hook on webtoon mm -hmm. uh vertical scroll comics online and um uh, I did a, I did a short story, I think for Dark Horse Presents, uh, called Emotional Ebola, Ebola, and I was like, is that we're gonna go away now? We no one talks about Ebola anymore, but it's true. I still think that you know people will get what I'm saying. You know that you know what what the joke was that I was going for in the story. You know, um, but yeah, the Red Hook was basically kind of like my love letter to superhero comics. Um, through uh, a character called the Red Hook, who lives in Red Hook, Brooklyn, New York. And I don't know if you ever got a chance to see or read those comics. I, I know I didn't send you anything, but um, I, I I took a quick look. I didn't uh, dive deeply, but I want okay. I saw I saw there was a number of seasons, and I was like, I want to take this, you know, oh, kind of <laughs> from the beginning and take it slow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, uh, it's about a super thief uh, that is forced to become a superhero against his will, or he will die. Uh, during a time where uh, Brooklyn uh, is, is, is revealed to be sentient and um, is so heartbroken by the way the world is functioning these days that she decides to physically and literally secede from New York, ergo America, to start her own republic where you can uh, barter art for food and services. So it's, 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 it's a lot going on and there's a lot of fun character stuff and characters based on Brooklyn, you know, named after Brooklyn neighborhoods and, and all kinds of consequences. And it gets very cosmic and weird. 
And, and it's basically a five year story. Uh, and so the next Kickstarter, which I haven't announced, uh, but I've started to talk about it is going to be a red hook Kickstarter. And part of the reason I, like I said, I had written the second story for COVID cop, but I'm going to do that after the red hook, because of what I want to do is establish like this Dean Haspiel universe, this, this initial triptych of, mm -hmm. of my heroes, you know? Um, and so starting with COVID cop, then you have Billy Donald, Jane legit, and then you'll have a red hook story with some of those characters. Uh, and I don't want to say too much more about it, but there's a really interesting twist that I've added that I don't think has happened, uh, ever or not often in comics, which is kind of like a very indie alternative, uh, sensibility. Uh, let's just say I'll, I'll, I'll use two words. I institute speculative memoir in, into this comic. Uh, <laughs> something I've been wanting to do uh, that again, I don't want to, I don't want to say too much about yet because I'm still trying to form uh, the, you know, the short pitch version, but um, I've already written that script. And after I finish a couple of small gigs, uh, I, I'm probably going to start drawing that one in about a month and then hopefully launch something probably the end of January and see if I can, you know, uh, kickstart that one. So this is going to be a continuation rather than what you did with uh, Billy Dogma and Jane Legit, which was sort of a collection of... Well, that's a collection or... with some new material. COVID Cop is okay. all brand new. This will be all brand new. And it, what it will do is kind of be a little bit of a kind of a catch-up primer for the new Red Hook reader. Okay. It'll also be... Uh, a lot, of, a lot of the whatever my 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 fan base is for Red Hook will also very much enjoy this and see how this is going to evolve into something a little bit more and a little bit different, and also serve as like I said, kind of like a uh, uh, a triptych for like the basis of this kind of universe that I'm building out. That you know, I'll then I'll probably do COVID Cop two, and then I'll figure out what's next. You know, like. Am I going to try to merge something here or try and create an anthology of short story? I don't know yet. I also have longer stories I want to do, but those are harder to do on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Like I'm trying to do these, these, these things that I can do in two to three months. Right. Yeah. And then try to kickstart it, make the money back that I invested in the, the artist creator, i.e. me, you know, pay my bills, but also be able to print and, and uh, ship these comics to your doorstep, you know? And then I got to figure out, the retailer version like can i have a retailer can these go into stores uh the thing is is that it just it cuts my profit by a, like a third at that point because mm -hmm. you know? you're still paying for the printing you're still paying for the shipping then then the discount uh, off the cover price and i'm charging a little bit more than usual for a 24 page comic because it, it is a little more artisanal because i am the store you can only get it from me which is why I also dig this kind of DIY culture that I'm noticing more and more online. You know, this isn't the four or $5 Marvel DC comic you're going to get next week. Uh, you know, that's a different system. Okay. And that's a different audience in some ways. Um, so really I am trying to appeal to a certain kind of reader that, you know, in this Patreon age we live in right now, you know, uh, where people like to support the artist, the creator, you know, over the corporation as much i'm not against the corporation and yeah. i understand there's some evil in in corporations and blah 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 but i consume and enjoy a lot of that stuff too you know i'm not lying i mean i it, it, it's fun stuff but also there is there is a time right now where people are supporting the creator and the artist and and if i i would like to continue down that path if possible yeah, um, I mean, you just anticipated my question about, you know, are are you enjoying this this kickstarting format, right? Which seems to be kind of the, you know, people are starting, you know, working kinks out, but so many um, writers and artists and creators are are going this route at least partially um, because it gives uh, such a um, amount of creative freedom um, and also sort of a direct connect with uh, fans and being able to, you know, have that conversation. Um, so it, it seems like you're definitely more interested in doing more of these, if not being like all in on the well, entirety I would, of it. I would love to figure, I mean, listen, a lot of, a lot of our small press 
or I mean, hell, I think even Marvel has kickstarted something. You know, like Kickstarter is a tool to publish. Yeah. Okay. And in a lot of ways, if you really think about it, if you go on Amazon and there's a book coming out or a movie or whatever, but it's not going to be available for another month or whatever, you do a pre-order, right? Right. That's what people are doing on Kickstarter. You are pre-ordering and helping co-produce a book, basically, yeah. you know? So, and it may cost a little more or may take a little longer time or whatever, you know? I would love to convert some of my plays I've written into graphic novels or, or maybe try to... You know, go like Dan Cloud just came out with Monica, right? And mm -hmm. and came out with Patience uh, five years ago and other stuff. Like he's basically, and there's no, not necessarily any genre attached to it. It's a Dan Cloud's comic book, right? right? So I want to publish Dean Haspiel comics, and that's not egotistical. It's just me trying to figure out how to be an artist in 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 comics terms, you know, um, and so. Do I love wearing all the different hats, publisher, promoter, you know, sitting here for a week and a half with just boxes and signing comics and then handwriting often people's addresses? Not necessarily, but at the same time, I'm making connections, you know, of some sort. Uh, would it be a good problem to have if I sold so many comics that there was no way in hell I could do it all alone? Of course, that would be great. I don't know what that looks like yet. I don't know what that involves. But, you know, that would be really cool. And you know what I like? I would like to have something that was making me money while I slept. You know? I'm not getting <laughs> that kind of royalty check. We, wouldn't we? Exactly. So if, if I can get to that place, fantastic. Right now, it's hand over fist. And, and me literally, I don't like to say begging, but like, you know, reminding people that there's something available made by me that you might want. And hopefully when you get it, you dig it and you want some more, right? I mean, yeah. the end. for now, that's how it looks. So. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so a couple more questions before we close out. One, uh, maybe this is for a different time. I wanted to dig more into your your collaborations, but I, I feel like we've, uh, we, we've strayed from that. So we'll come back maybe for a sequel on that. Sure, um, or you can throw one out at me if there's one that's, well, I mean, I'd rather ask these other these other ones. Okay. One is about, um, well, another format sort of question, right? You've actually been pretty heavily involved in web comics, right? Uh, yeah. Everything, and we were talking before yeah. uh, we started recording uh, about your work with Activate. Uh, you were on Zuda, the the DC Comics imprint slash contest that uh, ran. Um, and uh and other way and you know other um sort of form of webtoons things like that um where do you see web comics now and where do you think they're going and do you think that format ever really or has hit its sort of like sweet spot at all or do you think it's still people have to sort of figure it out well i think uh... I have a weird relationship with webcomics because when we were talking earlier, the idea that something is free or, you know, sure, it might come with ads, but you're not really paying for it, let's right. say, you know, um, makes it feel less than sometimes. So when I was trying to sell comics either through Marvel DC, you know, franchise comics, working on franchise comics, or publishing my own independent comics through print and retail, you had to buy it. And if you bought it, you probably tried to read it, okay? Because you spent money on it and you had something of an investment, a financial investment, and then hopefully an emotional investment or mm -hmm. something, right? But when it comes to web, it's so fleeting because I'm competing for your time. You're probably going to go on Instagram, social media of all sorts, email, maybe watch a bunch of trailers, whatever it is that people do on their phones and on their laptops, right? And now I'm asking you to follow a serialized story on a weekly basis. You know, in 2006, that was a little bit easier to, to pull off because there wasn't a lot of this back then. Yeah. Now, oh my God, there's a billion comics, okay? I did four and a half seasons of The Red Hook on Webtoon. And Webtoon would often, maybe the first two weeks of my comic launch, they would put up in the banner, like, oh, check out The Red Hook by Dean Haspiel. And then that was it. That was about it. And then once in a while, 
depending on who I was working with, we could get a little bit more hype, maybe in a newspaper or at a website or whatever, and try to keep building momentum. Because, you know, then we're getting to chapter 9, 10, 11. You know what happens at 9, 10, 11? Most people are like, you know, what? I'll wait till the whole thing's over. I'll read it then. Hmm. You know, just like they would because they know it's basically a graphic. Right. Now, unless I'm creating something that you have to read every week. Oh, my God. I can't stand it. And what's happening? Like, you know, when the TV show Lost was out. Right. And freaking out every week. Right. And coming up with their theories. I'm not writing and drawing anything like that. Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody really is, to be honest. So. I think at the end of the day, the, the, the commodity isn't money, it's time. But the problem is, how do you monetize this? You know. So when I was doing comics for Webtoon, I was actually being paid something because that was part of my deal. right? But I think a lot of that has changed since. And now it's based on popularity, hits, numbers. Maybe there's a little bit of a money to give up front, but not like they used to because they're expanding about you know their pool, their talent pool or... or, or they're they're you know the amount of comics they're publishing and i'm not talking about webtoons only i'm sure you know the other uh outfits are doing that as well however i will so i don't know a lot of my stuff started as a web comic that then turned into print okay uh now i'm thinking the other way right now like why don't i try to do something that's more print oriented don't allow it to be seen seen as much uh online because I want you to see a panel or two as a teaser and go, wait a second, I want to know what's in that comic. And I need to buy it and have it in my hand. Okay. So I think in a weird way, it's kind of like an allergic reaction mm. to web to web comics is print. <laughs> you know, yeah. although yeah. a lot of web comics eventually become go into print. Like I was just talking to Tom Akel, who's the guy who brought me to Webtoon, and he has this great publishing uh concern called Rocket Chip. And he is publishing a lot of web comic uh, first, you know, uh, material, you know, right. they're now transitioning to print because at the end of the day, I think people still like to read that way, yeah. you know, because we're, we're always on our phone for everything else that maybe reading is back that has, that's made of paper with a bind binding or something, you know? So I don't know, but I do, I do, I do always advise when someone new that's that's new to comics asked me what do i do dean what, how do i break into the business my first answer is i don't know anymore okay number two you have the internet you know put your stuff up online tell people about it you know see yeah. how people react see what happens but i will say this don't don't like get discouraged if after three or four weeks of publishing or putting stuff up online and you're just getting crickets don't let that stop you. Do it because you have to do it. Don't do it because it's a popularity contest. Who cares? You know, a, a, a former studio mate, John Allen, every Friday posts like a 10 panel comic uh, that then event, eventually will be put in print. And every week, you know, because you get like 10 Instagrams, you know, he does it on Instagram, one, two, three, and then he, he's able to figure that's his constraint, right? Square 10. That's the next sequence of his book. And he does it every week for his own deadline, also to build a fan base and eventually see, well, do you want to buy the book and read it this way, you know, or give it as a gift or whatever, you know? So I think they can work in tandem, but my biggest concern is if I wanted to do a webcomic first, I need to get paid. I'm not waiting for any backend deal. I, I, I have bills to pay, you know? I don't have a, the kind of savings that one might have to be able to just work on a graphic novel uh, for free. I can't do that, you know? So these little 24 to 48 page projects seem to fit my ability right now, but I'm just living off the fumes of Kickstarter, basically, and, and the occasional gig. Yeah. And I've said no to other longer paying, uh, longer gigs that pay, because I'm trying to find, trying to carve this autonomous lane that I'm in right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're not alone, right? I think a lot of people are trying to figure this out as to what the best balance is for them creatively and obviously, you know, financially uh, right. to make, make things make sense. Um, and I don't, you know, I think it's probably going to be different for everybody. Um, Everyone, but it, it is not a template. There's no template. Yeah, exactly. What, what's good about 
what's happening now is that there are so many kind of avenues, right? You can try to and experiment with different ways of putting things out and um and and find the right lane for you. Um, you know, I was thinking when you were talking about sort of the allergic reaction of uh, uh to to sort of the web comics uh, being being print, I was thinking of um the analogy to music, right? When MP3s and you started getting, you could get anything you wanted, right? And that's also when vinyl came back and started really taking off. And I think it was the same thing. It was like, uh, well, Absolutely. well, now that I can get anything on my phone, I want to, I want to have something physically and be like, be able to sit down and listen and concentrate and have the physical object back. I mean, the physical object is as much. I think I was talking to you uh, before we started recording about how I have I I have no space in my apartment you know because the amount of physical media I have but you know in talking about like this mp3 thing like you know one of the biggest bands in the world tried to give away a free album and got dissed if you recall remember when yep. what was the sign of kind of iphone update or something or or came with the yeah, phone yeah i think you yeah i album. think it was a, it was a, a, one of the the ios updates right so even if you didn't have the latest phone if you get the latest like software right it just came down with it and the, people the were YouTube pissed album. off and i'm like yeah. what is wrong you cannot like you too or whatever but you're angry that you got a free album like i don't even understand that like that's in, just don't listen to it or whatever or like how is it invading your life in such a negative way like yeah sure it was a stunt you know and some kind of marketing ploy and and th those guys don't need your your money to buy the album so they're just putting out some music right but geez louise everybody to take a chill pill you know like <laughs> um yeah no i i don't know man i think i think we're vying for everyone's time and time is is weirdly yeah. precious and yet like someone will see a, a two hour movie and their review will be meh or I want my two hours back. I'm like, did you spend three hours just scrolling through Instagram today? Like someone tried to make a movie. OK. Right. And yeah, you may not like it or maybe it didn't work out well. But that movie had people cooking food for the actors and, this, and the crew. Yeah. There were people trying to make something good. OK. Hundreds of people. Hundreds of people, and they had a job that got paid, you know, like you got to show some respect, you know, but maybe that's just me, old, old man yelling at a cloud. I don't know. <laughs> that's okay. We all, uh, you know, bunch our fists up and shake yeah. at the kids on the shed. That's right. <laughs> so another um, thing I, I, I'm before we wrap it up, another thing was like, I'm, I, I've started doing a little more mentoring, like one-on-one, -on -one, and I might do some group mentoring as a way to, uh, create some income, but also because I do like to impart whatever wisdom I might be able to share. Mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, whenever someone shares their their ideas with me, it's not that I insert myself into it to try to, quote, make it better. It's just I try to understand what is it you're trying to say and help bring clarity to your story through the medium of comics or whatever storytelling uh, medium it might be. So that's something that also I'm I'm considering kind of starting to promote a little bit more as well as I have a sub stack where I basically put out one or two newsletters a month to kind of promote stuff and, and talk about this and that. But I'm also considering doing some kind of a subscription based thing where I, I do offer more material uh, for, for, you know, subscribers uh, willing to pay something, you know? So I am going to be entering that, that, that lane as well, you know? And we're back. Anditos, what did you think about that interview? I really enjoyed talking to Dean. He's got a lot going on. He's got a lot more ideas percolating. Definitely check out those comics uh, that we talked about. They are going to be in the show notes. Um, and I think there are more adventures of Billy Dogma on the way. There may be more COVID cop. You never know what's going to come from uh, the good old mind of Dino. So um, glad you were with us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for viewing. Thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing. Please support us at buzzsprout.dollarbinbandits.com and we will see you next time. Peace.